All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good job by Andre. Glad to have him on board. Uh, my name is Ed Sikora. I'm an extension plant pathologist with Auburn University. I've been here for 30 years now, so time flies when you're having fun. Today, we're going to talk about concurrent disease management. Uh, Andre referred to this a bit. Uh, I thought I should just mention what cucurbits are because uh, it does incorporate a number of different plants, but it's plants in the gourd family. And this would include watermelons and cantaloupe, pumpkins, summer squash and winter squash, as well as cucumber. So some of the diseases I'll talk about go to different members of this family uh, more than others, you might say. And I'll try and mention that as we move along. I'm going to focus on uh, some foliar diseases and thracnose and gummy stem blight, two fungal problems. Uh, downy mildew and powdery mildew, which look like uh, kissing cousins, but they're actually uh, uniquely different. Also foliar problems. We'll talk about an insect transmitted bacterial disease. Uh, also a number of plant viruses, interesting organisms. All uh, The four I list there are all aphid transmitted. We'll also talk about a white fly transmitted virus briefly, and then I'll finish up with uh, root knot nematodes, one of the top five diseases in the world. Unfortunately, we have them all over the state. One thing when you go out and look at your garden and you're looking at some of these uh, crops is that you'll see a lot of leaf spots. So obviously, leaf spots catches everyone's eye. Um, we have problems like anthracnose, uh, gummy stem blight in the upper right hand corner, uh, target spot. Alton area leaf spot. Many times you might see multiple pathogens or multiple lesions on the same leaf. And they pretty much all look the same, uh, even to me after many years. Uh, so you're dealing with a lot of problems. Most of these diseases show up under warm, wet conditions, which we can have in Alabama, depending on the year, of course. Oftentimes more often in the fall or in the spring than during the hot summer. And thracnose, though, is one that we see quite a bit of. Uh, another fungal disease favored by warm, wet conditions. And I see this most often on cantaloupe, cucumber, and watermelon. And anthracnose is, uh, will cause a tan to brown spots uh, on the leaf surface. You also may see shallow, elongated tan spots on the stems, and then sunken areas on the fruit as well. And sometimes you'll see pink or orange discoloration in these sunken areas, which are actually spores of the pathogen. Can look different on different crops. You can see it on watermelon in the upper left. Again, somewhat small lesions in general. I believe that's on uh, squash and cucumber in the center and the right. Uh, bottom left, you can see fruit, the uh, fruit cankers or fruit, the sunken areas on watermelon. That was up at Coleman many years ago, but you can see that kind of pinkish orange discoloration. Those are actually fungal spores of the anthracnose fungi. Uh, far right was also cantaloupe at the same location in Coleman. Again, it gives off that discoloration, which is typical for this pathogen. Fortunately, we do have resistant varieties to this disease for watermelons and in some cases cantaloupe, and that'd be the best control. Um, Andre referred to this as far as uh, trying to avoid diseases and that look for resistant varieties for some of your major problems whenever they are available. With this pathogen, like most of your fungal pathogens, with any crop, you wanna to try to avoid overhead irrigation or limit it because this favors development of these pathogens. Uh, you wanna follow a fungicide spray program when conditions favor disease development. I know we have a variety of growers from home gardeners and master gardeners to um, commercial growers on the call today. Chlorothalonil is one product that's been around for about 50 years now. Home gardeners could probably find it as Dacanil uh, at their local Lowe's or, or co-op. Uh, Bravo was a commercial, commercially available product, but it goes by a number of different names. Chlorothalonil is the active ingredient. These are protectant fungicides that have to be sprayed on the plant before the disease shows up to give you maximum protection. Mancozeb is also out there, another protectant fungicide. Goes by a number of different names. Occasionally you can find this in a garden store. Diethate and Manzate are two products that are um, often listed in, on commercial packages, so at your co-op but give you, they get to give you a decent control of anthracnose, but always look for resistant varieties if you have this problem, if it's recurring and you want to try to control it the best, most effective, I should say. Gummy stem blight's a disease that uh, growers see this, they often uh, start to cry. It's a 
Another fungal pathogen, oftentimes you might see it on the same foliage with anthracnose. Um, what you will see in the field is it appears your watermelons or cantaloupe are melting out from the middle. That's how I always describe it. Oftentimes it could be across a whole field or in sections of the field, but it's, it is spreading fairly rapidly. And what you'll see is leaf spots that are usually tan to brown to black in the lobes or in, along the edge of the leaves. They're kind of, they're kind of uh, they rip easily, but that's typical for gummy stem. They kind of target like in appearance. And then it gets its name from the stem lesions, the stomach, gut, they call it gummy stem blight. And if these lesions are one to six inches long, typically. They start at the nodes on the vines, um, spread longitudinally, and they can crack under moist conditions. You might get, and you might see a gummy ooze exuding from that lesion. And these uh, cankers can completely girdle those vines. And that's why you start seeing the dieback, like you see in the upper left hand corner, as these vines die back to the site of the canker. So it can be a devastating disease once it gets going and it's uncontrolled. A couple of shots on the left, upper one, you can see that little bit different coloration to these target-like lesions in the lobes. Three slides in the center would be the uh, cankers that you might see, different variations. The top picture shows this gummy ooze coming from the stem. I don't, I've only seen that once or twice over the years, but it, it is pretty cool looking as a pathologist, of course. Drier conditions, you might see a tan lesion. A bottom center, I already showed you that reddish brown lesion. And an upper right is a dried up lesion during a drought period of drought in uh, Wetumpka. And uh, that's, a, that's also gummy, some kind of a grayish looking. And then pathogen here, there is a, it's a complex really. You also can get a disease called black rot. And it kind of looks like blossom end rot on watermelons in a way, but a black rot on the edge of the fruit, also on a butternut squash there in the bottom right. So with gummy stem, we're looking for these large round target shaped spots in the lobes or on the edges of the leaves, cankers on the main stem near the nodes. And it's possible to, to observe gummy stem with anthracnose and some of these other foliar diseases because they all favor wet conditions. Uh, most common on melons. So watermelon, cantaloupe, I would say are the most uh, significant problems. Wet conditions favor disease development. So uh, wet weather like we had last spring uh, and how we had it all during 2020 or overhead irrigation, overdoing it can increase gummy stem blight, uh, the aggressiveness of the pathogen. And this, these pathogens usually start on the older leaves in the center of the plant and then spread outward. So if you're seeing damage at the tips of leaves, that's probably uh, abiotic in nature, maybe a chemical. So with gummy stem, I don't believe we have any resistant varieties right now. Uh, you can't follow a fungicide spray program with conditions favoring the disease. Uh, products like Apruvia, Top, and Luna Experience are considered good in our Southeast Guide. Those would be ones that commercial growers may be able to afford and find in the state. Uh, chlorothalonil is considered fair. And this is a product that has the active ingredient, goes by a number of different trade names. Daconil is a common one that you might find in your local stores, uh, also commercially available, but it's a protectant fungicide that needs to be on the plant when, when weather conditions favor its development. That's when you start spraying. You don't spray when the disease is already showing up on the plants because you get behind it pretty quick. This disease will take you out quickly. Uh, powdery mildew. Sorry about that. Powdery mildew is a disease I think most people have seen. If they realize what it is, I'm not sure, but it hits a number of different crops and it hits us, all cucurbits. We're all susceptible, they're all susceptible. More commonly on cucumbers, on, a, on squash, both yellow and winter squash and on pumpkins. The pathogen, the fungal pathogen overwinters on weeds. So it oftentimes just around your garden or field and then it moves into the garden on wind current. So it can move fairly long distances from a neighbor's yard or a neighbor's field. It likes high humidity and abundant plant growth. So if you have a lot of, if you over fertilize with nitrogen, you have an abundant growth that will favor development of powdery mildew. And I mentioned it, no free water is necessary for this disease, this pathogen. Most of your fungi, 99% of them like, like it warm and wet or cool and wet, but powdery mildew likes it hot and dry. So even during a drought year, most diseases are, are, are taking it easy. 
powdery mildew is going crazy. And what you'll see typically on the old upper leaves will be a yellow spot. And then the mildew, this talcum powder-like growth shows up on the lower leaf surface and then eventually takes over the foliage. You can see some of the colonies of powdery mildew on the upper three slides. If you were to look at these under a microscope, you'd see chains of conidial spores emanating from that lesion as the fungus just invades the epidermal cells here. But again, it's talcum powder-like in appearance. It doesn't, powder mildew doesn't go to the fruit directly, but it will go to the handle. So it's a problem for pumpkin growers because it will hit, hit that handle, weaken it. And of course, when you go to, to pick them or when a child, a school bus goes out to a U-pick operation, grabs that handle, it falls off and that pumpkin loses value quickly but not to the fruit directly. Mildew starts in the center of the plant, spreads out, so you lose that photosynthetic area quickly. Typically with mildew, you don't lose the leaves. They stay on as, the, as a brown source of, of inoculum. So you have these brown erect uh, dead leaves in the center of your plant, but it exposes the plant, you have less photosynthetic area, uh, exposes the fruit to sun scald, and of course, as in the bottom right, you can see where the plants in this die early, the leaves are gone. You get smaller fruit than you typically want, both for home garden or for marketing. So powdery mildew. Best control would go with a, would be a powdery mildew tolerant or resistant variety. Uh, I worked with these, uh, well, it's been about 20 years ago now, but uh, these varieties do work quite well. Uh, occasionally, you do have to supplement them with a fungicide just to, especially when conditions really favor mildew. And of course, you might have other diseases showing up. You want a balanced fertility program. You don't want to overdo the nitrogen. Uh, good weed control, especially around the field uh, and even in the field to reduce uh, humidity. You want good airflow. And then fungicide sprays are available. Uh, what we're seeing, though, throughout the southeast with some of these diseases like powdery mildew and downy mildew, and even gummy stem, you're seeing some of the, these pathogens becoming resistant to some of our fungicides because of overuse and abuse of these materials. Same with insecticides, I guess. So you want to uh, rotate fungicides whenever possible because of these resistant strains of powder and mildew to these products. This is out of our, our spray guide, uh, good efficacy for Luna experience in Gatton. And our spray guide changes as far as efficacy, as far as effectiveness yearly as new, new species, or I shouldn't say species, but new biotypes evolve that become resistant to some of these materials. I do have chlorothalonil, it's fair in efficacy for this disease, but that would be one for a home gardener that should be able to get their hands on. Some of these other products, I have Randman on there, which I was just told before I started is not labeled for uh, uh, for cucurbits or for some of the some of the cucurbits, but uh, these other products can be had at co-ops or purchasing long distance. I suspect some of these products are very expensive this year, just with some of the uh, the problems we're having with COVID and other problems. Okay, I was talking about powdery mildew, which is on the right, with those white colonies. Now I'm going to talk about downy mildew, which is on the left, and which is just this bright yellow angular lesion, and it, they should be similar, but downy is a, we call these, a, what we used to call this a water mold pathogen, or it is a water mold pathogen, so it likes it cool and wet, powdery, likes it hot and dry. Now, downy, probably, to, I, I've been following this disease in the state for 15 years. We have monitoring plots throughout Alabama because it can be devastating once it gets going. Uh, classic symptoms here on cucumber are these bright yellow angular lesions. As uh, these lesions are somewhat, uh, can't cross these, these veins in the leaves, so it's pretty uh, apparent. And it, these start on the older leaves, in the center of the plant. If you flip this leaf over on the corresponding lower leaf surface where that lesion is, you would see kind of a velvety, fluffy growth. And those are the fungal spores of downy mildew. So at 40 magnification, you would look on a dissecting scope, you'd see these black spore balls, basically, uh, which are the spores, the, the sporangia, sporangia spores of the pathogen. At 100x in the bottom right, you'd see these Christmas tree-like structures um, with the spores present. So 
can be a very aggressive pathogen with the spore production on the lower leaf surface. So getting a, when you do spray, trying to get a, the upper leaf surface and the lower leaf surface can be very important. So downy mildew, uh, cucumbers, pumpkin, winter gourds, especially butternut are all very susceptible. We do see it on watermelon, uh, on cantaloupe, they're moderately susceptible. Uh, things like, uh, what was another one I had here? It can spread long distances in air currents. Uh, it's interesting about downy mildew in that it, it, right now it's developing down in South Florida, usually down in the winter markets in that area. And then it moves from South Florida in the Caribbean up through Florida and then spreads eventually throughout the United States. So uh, our downy mildew right now is vacationing on the beach is probably in Tampa or somewhere, but it'll, it'll be on the move soon. The disease often moves up the East Coast and then up into the Midwest to, to, to damage pumpkin crops, say in Indiana and Illinois. Sometimes it goes west into Alabama, and that's where our, our, our source is, more or less. And depending on weather conditions, it'll be determine how significant downy mildew is in Alabama. It refers moderate temperatures and wet leaves for disease development. So it doesn't like the nine degree temperatures we see in late June, July, and August. But we do see some outbreaks. Last year, we saw some outbreaks in June because we had cooler, wetter temperatures. And then in the fall is when it really gets going on your winter gourds and pumpkins. Get the foliation, poor fruit growth, sun skull when the foliage is gone. This was a trial I had on uh, of pumpkins over at uh, in Shorter, Alabama, near Tallahassee. This was two years ago, and you can see those lesions on the upper leaf surface here. You'd see spores in the lower leaf surface. And this pathogen really looks different on, on each cucurbit. It doesn't look the same. And sometimes I confuse one disease with another because of the difference in hosts. This is a, a similar field last year on butternut squash, which is very uh, susceptible to it all. You see the lesions are some a little bit darker in this case, but it starts in the center and then spreads out. If you don't apply a fungicide early, uh, it will do a quite, a, quite a bit of defoliation and cut back on your yields. So a lot of control methods here, but one thing you, you might want to try to avoid it. Plant cucurbits as early as possible. So cucumbers in the spring, pumpkins maybe a little bit early if you can. Uh, downy mildew is more of a problem in the fall because oftentimes we have cooler temperatures. We have susceptible crops like uh, winter gourds and pumpkins being planted at that time. So commercial growers, you got to be more uh, reliant possibly on a fungicide spray program. You can use downy mildew resistant varieties when they're available. I think more and more of these are coming on the market. Things like yellow squash, zucchini, and acorn squash seem to tolerate downy mildew better than, say, pumpkins and uh, cucumbers, um, and they will produce marketable fruit typically. Uh, fungicide spray program is important when weather conditions favor disease development. And once again, you want to get ahead of the pathogen uh, before it really gets going. If half the crop or half the plants are already infected with the disease, and then you then you think you're going to spray a fungicide to control it, that's you're going to be a loser every time. So. Uh, Ronman and aluminum are fair to good. I mentioned chlorothalonil and mancozeb for home gardeners, but these are considered poor uh, for control. So think more as a home gardener, you might want to think about planting your cucurbits early in the season than late. Also, if you double crop, if you have cucumbers early and then you want to come back with pumpkins later in the same field or garden, and if you have downy mildew in that early crop, it's going to be a source of inoculum for the later crop. Always think about that in the home garden, and especially in a commercial field, you have these side by side. I want to mention a bacterial problem. We're going to talk about bacteria, then viruses, and then those three other types of biotic diseases. Uh, bacterial will was the first disease I saw in Alabama. That slide in the upper left is from Foley, Alabama, and it's a cantaloupe grown on uh, raised black plastic mulch. And you can see those vines dying back there. And that's typically the early symptoms of bacterial wilt. And eventually the bacterium gets inside the plant, moves to the crown. Then you start seeing the whole plant shutting down. And this can be confused with things like uh, some of your insect dams, some of your borers as well. So you have to differentiate between the two. Uh, in the field, sometimes I do what they call a bacterial ooze test, which impresses people at times, other pathologists at least, but if the Vine is still turgid near the crown. You could take two stems, 
slice them with a, with a sharp knife and then slowly push them together, mush them up and then slowly pull them apart. And you'll see these bacterial ooze strands between those stems, which, a po which is a positive test to identify the disease in the field. Uh, interesting about this, the disease cycle, I always find interesting in that it's spread by cucumber beetles. I know we have spotty cucumber beetles and stripe, and I'm sure you, all of you have seen these, kind of a little bit like ladybugs, but more elongated. Um, but they vector or carry the bacterium in their gut. So the beetles feed on the leaf surface just by rasping the uh, upper leaves, the epidermal leaves, the outer cell, and they open up a wound in that plant. And then they exude the bacterium outside their back end, which if it comes into contact with that wound, the bacteria enter the plant, Bacteria multiply rapidly and then can move from the wound into the veins, down into the vines, and then eventually down to the crown when it shuts down the plant, like you see in the upper left-hand corner. So controlling bacterial wilt, you can't do with the copper bacteria side. You can't do it. There are resistant varieties that I'm aware of. You have to try and control the vectors, the carriers, the beetles, which is very difficult. Um, there are some insecticides available. Uh, I'm not going to list those here because I'm not in it. But again, striped cucumber beetles, spotted cucumber beetles are the main vectors or carriers of this pathogen. And trying to control these guys, if you have a significant problem with uh, bacterial, you would need to target them versus the bacteria itself. <clears throat> a lot of talk because of COVID, we've been talking about viruses a lot in the last few years, unfortunately. Uh, I've worked with plant viruses for 30, 35 years. I find them fascinating just to do the dis disruption of the plant and the symptoms you see in the field are just um, staggering. So plant viruses, uh, all cucurbits are susceptible. They typically overwinter in weeds uh, around the field or in areas. So that's where they overwinter. This is where your inoculum source is. 90% of all your plant viruses are transmitted by insects. And these are often aphids or white flies or leafhoppers would be another example. We have four main aphid transmitting mosaic viruses, uh, cucumber mosaic, papaya ring spot, watermelon mosaic, and zucchini yellow mosaic virus, plus probably a couple others, but these are the main four that I found in some of our surveys. They get their name from the first host they were found at and then the main symptom they cause. So obviously we don't grow a lot of papaya in Alabama, but papaya ring spot does exist and is a common problem throughout the season. And then in recent years, we've been finding white fly that spread yellows viruses. And I, we've picked up two new ones in Alabama. Uh, Andre's worked with this over in Georgia before he came over to the good side here in Alabama. So that's becoming more of a problem. And with global warming, as it heats up and the winters get milder, these yellows viruses uh, might become more of a problem as white fly populations over winter farther north uh, in Alabama, we think. So symptoms of viruses, you get mottled leaves, mosaic leaf patterns. And that looks like you see in the bottom right where you have a dark green, this color or a dark green color intermingled with light green and yellow, mottled or it's a mosaic pattern. Distorted leaves, uh, stunted plants, uh, home garden, commercial field, you might see a few plants that are stunted right next to plants that look fine. And that's because aphids don't go to every plant. So you get some uh, uniform, non-uniform distribution in the field. Fruit can be stunted in size, modeled and deformed. And if the virus gets inside these plants early, you can get reduced yields. The earlier the virus gets inside the plant, the more severe the symptoms will be and the more reduction in yield that you might incur. So these are just some of the insect vectors, uh, aphids, all these fellows uh, vector the pathogen or spread the pathogen with the use of their mouth parts. And you can see kind of a diagram of a aphid in the upper left-hand corner. They feed with a stylet-like mouth part. Aphids say they fly over to uh, weeds next to your field and start probing that leaf surface. They probe on a weed that has some of these viruses present. When they pull that mouth part out, the virus particles are then attached to that stylet. They then fly into your, your garden or field start feeding on your watermelons or cantaloupe, and then they inject that virus in. And it takes only one minute, of one minute time for that aphid to pick up the virus and then to spread it. So trying to control viruses by spreading, spraying insecticides is nearly impossible, just not cost effective. Leafhoppers bottom right do the same thing. 
And then I mentioned white flies in the bottom left, vectors of these yellow viruses that uh, Andra and I are becoming more and more concerned with in Alabama. So just some classic symptoms here. This is uh, an aphid transmitted mosaic virus. Uh, sometimes I've, I found up to four or five different viruses in some of these plants. Uh, so they're very common in the state. We see them every year, but you see the drastic distortion of the foliage. And with these mosaic viruses, you typically see these symptoms in the newest growth. And the older leaves look fine. Sometimes you can't confuse this with herbicide injury, such as 2,4-D when you get a herbicide drift. But oftentimes you can see the pattern from the drift pattern that causes this type of distortion. And then this is just yellows viruses. This is on uh, some squash down in Bruton last uh, fall. Uh, bright yellow mosaic type pattern. With this, these yellows viruses, there's, and there's a number of them, but uh, I'm not gonna go through the names, but these will show up on the older, more mature leaves first, and the young leaves look fine. So that's the difference between yellows and the mosaic type viruses. And yellows, again, are vectored by or carried by white flies. But only, right now, we only find these right along the Florida border in south, east and southwest Alabama. As far as virus control, you, you, there are resistant varieties uh, we tested. Uh, some, some of the squash varieties, yellow squash and zucchini, that had resistance to all four of the mosaic viruses, and they did quite well. You want to try to avoid planting next to infected fields, uh, especially for if, you have, if you're double cropping in your home garden or if you, uh, for a commercial grower, you have different settings going out to try and meet the market. Try to avoid planting next to previously infected fields or infected or, or fields in general, other squat, other cucurbits. We control before planting around the gardener field is infective. We think about 85% of the viruses that, that attack a crop come from weeds that are within 30 feet of that border or of that planting. Insect control is, is difficult because they're such efficient vectors. Uh, I've worked with reflective mulches. You see that in the upper right-hand corner. If you ever go up to places like Sand Mountain in uh, Blunt County or in uh, Near Aniani, you'll see many of the tomato growers grow on raised silver reflective mulch uh, because they had to due to aphid transmitted virus problems they had back in the 90s. What happens in this case is when you plant your transplants in this reflective mulch, insects, um, they, the, the reflective mulch reflects UV light, which disturbs the insects and they will avoid landing on those plants. They get disrupted their flights. So eventually the, the plants overgrow that reflective mulch, they will become infected, but by that, that time they're mature and you have some mature plant resistance and your reduction in yield is limited. Very expensive though, uh, as far as commercial growers are concerned versus a black or a white. I think Andre's worked with row covers in the past. We've tried some of this in Alabama over the years where you, these are often used for frost protection for strawberries and some of the winter vegetables in Florida. Um, we were trying it here on pumpkins up in, uh, Crossville, Alabama many years ago, but you put these on, take them off when the blossoms start to come out and it will reduce early season infection by some of these insect-borne viruses. Okay, I'm gonna finish up with plant parasitic nematodes. Nematodes are the most numerous animal on the face of the earth, uh, more numerous than insects, but just not as diverse. They come in all different types and sizes. The ones I deal with, plant parasitic nematodes are only about a millimeter long. Most survive in the soil and feed on the roots of plants. Um, you can't see these with the naked eye. As I said, less than a millimeter long typically. They feed on the roots of plants, impairing the ability of the roots to absorb water and nutrients. And that's how you get some of the symptoms. Depending on the species, you might have one generation that takes 30 days or up to a year. And our most numerous nematode or more damaging nematode, root nine nematode, we can see uh, five generations per year with each female producing two, on average 200 eggs in a generation. So sometimes these nematodes get in your garden and they can't explode. They feed with a stylet like you see on the left, which is like a hypodermic needle. And the nematodes swim along the root system, eventually setting up a feeding site. They puncture the root with that stylet. They secrete enzymes to break down the cell contents and they reverse the flow to get their nutrition but which also damages the plant's ability to pick up moisture and nutrients. And in a pine of soil around the root system, you could find hundreds to thousands of, of nematodes of various species um, in a heavily infected field. 
same picture of Lance nematode on the left. They all come with cool names like Lance and pin nematodes and needle nematodes. On the right is a dagger nematode. If you look closely, you can see it's a style of deeply penetrated just behind the bean, a cap of a bean root. Some are ectoparasites, they feed on the outside. Others actually are endoparasites, meaning they get inside the root system. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. So symptoms that we often call this the, the uh, unseen enemy because you don't see nematodes, but you see the symptoms. And they often the symptoms are often typical of other problems. So stunting, uh, leaf yellowing like nitrogen deficiency, loss of plant vigor and overall health, Reduce yields, especially over time, as the population increases, your yields will drop. Wilting of plants, even when the soil is wet, is a dead giveaway. Larger fields, you may see non-uniform distribution of symptomatic plants, and that's just the way the nematodes are entered the field and how they got moved around. And then symptoms are more pronounced when plants are under stress from other factors. Uh, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a commercial carrot field down near Dothan, heavy root on nematode pressure, and that soil was like a beach sand in that area. So the nematodes are very happy. This is some gourds I had out at uh, Tallahassee uh, two years ago. Looked at the plants, they are yellowing up. I knew something was going on here. Um, wilting, I felt the, the moisture in that bed. It was saturated with moisture, but the plants are still wilting. I dug that plant up and on the right, you could see the galled root system uh, caused by a root, not nematode. Very few fibrous roots to pick up the moisture and nutrients those plants need. So you get the wilting and the dieback. Um, these are not because you have a nematodes the size of your thumb in those roots, but you have hundreds of nematodes that have invaded that root system endoparasitically. I'll show you a slide of that. But they secrete enzymes that cause the root cells to increase in size and numbers. So you get these ugly galled root systems, which are pretty easy to detect once you dig up those plants. Here's an adult female living in an endoparasite. She's gone from that vermiform, snake-like form to a bulbous type form. She, she could produce up to 600 eggs in a, in a generation. Uh, shady slide on the right, but you can see the yellowing in a watermelon field down in the headland area many, many years ago. But of course, it's only in a certain section, probably where it entered the field. Uh, these are some soybeans, which obviously are not cucurbits, but it, this is a great slide showing you the non-uniform distribution of, of, of root knot in this field where you see those yellow patches, you might even see some dead plants. That's where the heaviest population of root knot is, but you can see it's scattered throughout the field. So where the green plants are, you'll still probably find nematodes, but much at reduced populations. And then the galled roots on the bottom right is a dead giveaway for um, root knot. And that's the nematode you'd probably be most concerned with. So as far as management, when you think about site selection and nematode inspection, so if you're choosing your garden, your, 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 or your production field, you want to go to that field before you buy it or rent it or plant in it and then take a soil sample, first for one for fertility, but also a second sample for nematodes. Go through the field, take a soil sample, send it to the lab, and let's see what nematodes you might have there that might be damaging to the crops you plan on growing. And if you have a heavy root knot populations, you might want to avoid it. You can reduce plant stress through proper uh, fertility and, uh, and uh, irrigation. Add organic amendments. Uh, a lot of this is uh, high in antagonists, both fungi and bacteria, and other nematodes that might attack the parasitic types. Sanitation at the end of the season. If you do have root knot, you can't dig up those plants, leave them on the soil surface uh, late in the summer and early fall, let the sun beat down on those, and it'll kill some of the populations within the root. Uh, crop rotation. Um, Andre outlined this quite, quite well. So you want to rotate between crops. Uh, because nematodes don't typically go to everything. Uh, suppressive crops are available. We have a handout on this. C crops like crotillaria, partridge pea, sesame seed, uh, some types of marigolds will give off chemicals that will kill nematodes or slow them down. And that might be an option if you have a high root knot population, say, and limited place to plant. Fubigants are available for commercial growers, things like t C35, chloropicrin, and others, these are, can only be used by um, certified um, pesticide people with uh, obviously certification. Can't be used by home gardeners any longer, uh, but home gardeners can try solar solarization. You could Google that. We have a, a couple of handouts on that and from ACES, and it uses the sun's energy to heat the soil up to try and knock down these populations uh, during the summertime. 
So with that, I think I will, well, there's the, the Southeast U.S. Vegetable Crop Handbook that Andre mentioned. Uh, just Google 2022 Southeast U.S. The, the, the Crop Handbook and you will be able to get a download a PDF copy um, targeting more towards commercial growers, but also very useful when you're looking at uh, varieties um, for, uh, throughout the Southeast. Very, this is an excellent book. I would recommend you look at that. With that, I'll stop. Uh, that's me in the, in the black shirt. I found that at one of my colleagues' offices to the right. But uh, you can follow me at Alabama Ed, Ed Capital on Twitter, Alabama Ed. Uh, you could also contact me through David if you have questions or comments. With that, I'll stop.